You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call. I've got Brad Hunt here, Mm -hmm. the co-host of the show, and uh, today's guest, uh, Bo Beatty with uh, Wilderness Ridge Llamas. Yep. Uh, That's a business of yours, and I think you're the de facto llama packing expert in the world. Would you say that's fair? I don't know if that's fair, but I definitely have probably put, you know, in the last, the 21st century, Mm -hmm. have traveled the most, put the most time and effort into it. And also had the most failures, you know, (laughs) and I tried to learn from them and it's brought us to where we are today. Yeah. And people are like, wait a second, why are you still redesigning the saddles? Like, why are you still searching for llama genetics? Like, why are you, Mm -hmm. why do your gear and equipment change? And like, how come you're saying this now? And you used to say this is like, cause we learn. And I just, I don't, I just don't stop learning. Well, I would say this too, Bo, is like just what I'm, what I've noticed is you don't come out to market with something. If it's not correct, it takes you years. It takes a long time, you know, to come out to market with something. Yeah. Yeah. So today I want to talk about a number of things. Okay. Why llamas? And what's the difference between them and other pack animals? Because I've packed with mules. I've packed with uh, horses. I've packed with uh, even uh, goats. Mount, uh, yeah, goats. Pack goats. I had goats for years. Um, and I now ha- I have used llamas. So I want to get into that discussion, like why, why llamas, why not something else? What are the virtues? What are the, uh, the, what's the downside to llamas? Yeah. Kind of get into that. Uh, that's the first thing I want to cover. And then I want to get into, uh, some of what people don't realize is, um, what, what, like I used your shelter this year. I didn't even know you had one. Nice. Okay. Most people don't. So you've got this wall tent that I was like, wow, this is pretty sick. Um, cool. <clears throat> didn't, I didn't know, know about that you it. Used it. Actually, I was with Mark, and so I got to see it, and I'm like, "Whoa, this is different." And so I want to talk about that because I think there are a lot of guys out there who <clears throat> would leverage that setup. You know, we're big into our backpacking teepees, mm-hmm. right, right. But I got to tell you, man, when it was cold and you had that canvas going, and we had a little stove in there, I, I was like, I could get spoiled real quick. Well, I would and say with this. llamas, <clears throat> it's a it's a it's a very because I don't want to bring a traditional wall tent, and then for traveling or in mm-hmm. the car, it's a it's also another option. So I want to get into that. I want to cool. talk to you um, about the fact that you rent llamas. That is something that uh, I thought was not feasible the first time I heard about it. Didn't make sense to me to be able to rent a llama. Right. It'd be too much. Um, like, how does a person? You know, like. When you think of a horse, a person has to have, be a wrangler. Has they got to have the drill. Yeah, they have to have yeah. like all this vast level of experience. I mean, who do who they think they are? Just renting out a llama, <laughs> like so. That's funny. So I want to I want to get in into that and uh, and but so let's start off at the beginning. Sure. Okay. Why llamas? You know, I mean, I grew up with horses and mules and. I knew, I knew their place, you know, I understood what they're capable of, you know, on the, on the ranch side of things, on the back country, packing big camps and, and on the side of things as well. And I always had an appreciation for them, but the truth is like growing up, I used to, I just didn't like riding. I enjoyed the horses. I enjoyed being around them. I loved packing them, but I would just much rather pack a horse or a mule and walk with it everywhere. My dad would be riding or my grandparent, my grandpa would be riding and it drove him crazy. He's like, it's like, you have a horse, ride it. (laughs) And um, I just didn't get the enjoyment out of it like they did. And then I started to realize, like in my late teenage years, like, you know what? I think I'm a little bit more attentive as a hunter being on the ground, even though my dad and grandpa and great grandpa and uncles and all my family and these people that we were hunting with were so experienced. I still felt like Mm -hmm. I was keen in on the things being on the ground that they weren't. Yeah, And it just was a different style. And so from the very beginning of my hunting career and life and just being a backcountry person, I was like, being on the ground is the way, it's just who I am. And so I went on a uh, LDS mission to Argentina, learned a lot about llamas and goats over there. Mm. And uh, when I came back and went up to the UNS and I saw these uh, llamas working in the UNS and I was like, 
this is so cool that something in a different culture is utilized for mm-hmm. living for their lifestyle, not just like, you know, recreation, yeah, I mean, having food fun. and everything. Yeah, yeah. Everything. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. When you were in Argentina, did you see llamas at work then? We did, you know, and the most of the llamas that we saw were llamas that they used for wool until they got to a certain age and then they eat them. Oh, but there were places in the mountains where they were packing them and, you know, and I was like, there's, and they were very different looking llamas. Okay. The ones they were using for wool. And I didn't understand that. And they'd call them these different names. And I'm like, I just, yeah, no yeah. one could translate <laughs> to me. It's like, explain to me why they're calling this one, like this name and this one, this one. And they right. look totally different. Yeah. And so I didn't understand it at the time, but I realized look, this is the working llama and this is the me and the wool llama. Right. You know, and there were basically two distinctions in Argentina. And I, so I understood as like, okay, this is a work animal is a pretty serious deal. Mm-hmm. And I would see them just carry these massive, massive loads and they were going short distances and they're all being kilos. I'm like, they're like, yeah, 60, 70 kilos is what we're putting on them. I'm like, that is so much mm-hmm. weight. Yeah. And they weren't very big animals, especially compared to what we have now at our ranch. Yeah. They're just, I mean, it's almost like two different species. Their animals are like 300 to 320. Ours are 380 to 440. Just totally different size structure. Hmm. And so I got to see him work over there. And when I came back, I was going to college and I just didn't have, you know, no, I was away from the ranch. I couldn't afford a horse. And I started hiking and backpacking, you know, in the winds and Wyoming range and a lot on the continental divide. And then I shot my first elk, um, I think in 2009 with my bow when I was in college. Sweet. And, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, it's September <laughs> 6th and it's really hot. I better call somebody. So I called the buddy. He's like, Hey, can you come and help me get this elk out? And people have listened to a few podcasts. have heard the story before he hikes in and on the way in the same herd elk that I shot into, I shot a, a bull out of it. They were just ripping off. So we make one cow call, a little five point comes down he shoots it. Oh no. And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> now we got to tell you. And have this, two. Is, this is freshman year of college, right? And we're supposed to be back to school back to school on Monday and it's a, you know, Friday night. Mm-hmm. So we start packing elk out. We don't show up to school. It's like Tuesday or Wednesday <laughs> and barely got out with the meat not being spoiled. And so I was like, what okay, school? BYU, Idaho. Yeah, me too. Right here in Rexburg. And I was okay. like, we, we have to figure something else out. You know, so I called my grandpa. My dad was had passed away at this time. I called my grandpa, who's kind of always been my, my friend and mentor in, in the outdoor world and space. And he's like, you should look at uh, look at goats and mm-hmm. burrows. And then um, you all you know about llamas. And he hated llamas. He was super against it. Yeah. For no real reason besides the fact that he was a cowboy. Yeah. Right. So I tried goats. And I kept them the goats all throughout my, like, trying experimental stages. Yep. And I tried burrows and I knew I couldn't afford a horse. And then I found a guy on Craigslist that had a couple llamas in Wyoming. So I went to Walmart, got a bunch of their like pallets, made a little, you know, makeshift thing in the back of my truck, went and got the llamas in, in Wyoming, you know, and I'm broke. So I have barely enough money to get there, <laughs> buy llamas and come back. And I'm renting this pasture. How'd your wife feel about all this? Wasn't married yet. <laughs> that wouldn't have gone well. <laughs> And, you know, so I've got, I've got burrows and I've got, you know, a, one horse and I've got don, uh, don, or, you know, the burrows and the goats mm-hmm. and then llamas yeah. all in this little pasture. So it's not like you don't have a lot of experience with all the options. All the options. So you figured out which animal is the most stubborn because <laughs> yeah. burrows are pretty stubborn. Horses yeah. can be really stubborn. So I'm trying this whole thing out. And meanwhile, I'm going broke feeding them all. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out and I'm buying used gear and I'm fixing it. And I bought a little sewing machine. I'm trying mm-hmm. to like buy saddles and I'm just trying everything and I'm pushing everything to the limits. And out of those two llamas that I bought, one of them was just terrible, you know, way out of shape, way overweight. They just couldn't walk to the mailbox and back. Mm. And the other one was pretty awesome. And Mm. he was, he was just taking off and doing really, really well. And I was like, this is really sustainable. I can put them in the back of my pickup truck. You know, it's cheap to feed them almost identical to feeding the goats. He can carry more weight than the goats can doesn't mind crossing water, does really well in snow. His ice is, ice llamas do terrible at. So, you know, mental notes, stay away from the ice. And, uh, he doesn't mind going alone. So it was me and him for a while. And I started getting rid of the burrows, got rid of my one horse, got rid of the, mm. and the horse was given to me, by the way. There's a lot of free horses at that time. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, <clears throat> I started to realize like, wow, llamas are pretty 
incredible because I can, and then I started to get a couple more. And by the time I had about 10 of them, I had three or four that were really good. And I realized like a guy can beat a backpack hunter and also can in most scenarios, right. Mm -hmm. And beat a horse hunter for these reasons. He can beat the backpack hunter because he can camp wherever the backpack hunter wants to camp which is up high, away from water, and have enough water with the llamas to sustain himself for three to four days. So the llama guy goes up, camps where he wants to camp, stays there for three to four days, doesn't waste any time, which is most important, or energy getting water. So that's pretty incredible, right? Mm -hmm. you got to carry some with you with the llamas, but that's the goal. Yep. Carry light, have a backpack mentality. And so what you're saying saying is there's no water accessible at the top of this hunting spot, ridge, whatever. Something, yeah. Um, there's no water up there. No so water. in order to hunt the area, you have to pack water there. Yep. So a backpack hunter has to haul up a and down, up ton and down. of water up there, or they have to drop an elevation to grab water and go Every back day. up. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh-huh. Yep. And so I was like, wait a second. So I can say, so the llama can carry enough water for three or four days for you and itself. Right. Yeah, one llama. And if you've got two. That's impressive. So if you decided, like, okay, I'm going to try to get five days. i got a five-day hunt. I'm going to take two llamas. And put all your water on two llamas. Mm-hmm. And then put your camp and your food on your back. And then when you come out, you just put all your game in on the llamas. And this is a pretty, this is kind of like ideal scenario that I did for a long time. So mm-hmm. me and two llamas go in. They've got nine gallons of water per llama, 18 gallons of water. And so for basically... For five days, the llamas have all the food and water they need. I have all the food and water I need. And I can not only camp up high and not have to worry about water, waste of time, but I can progressive camp. Meaning if the elk, I busted them up and made a mistake, someone else yeah. did, or they moved. like, okay, see ya. And it doesn't matter my next camp. That could be anywhere. Mm-hmm. I, and I can just go because I got five days of and, all the water And you I still need. got your llamas to pack out. And I got my llamas to pack out. Yeah. So I realized it's like horse guys can't do that. Right. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the thing that drove me crazy about the horses and they're amazing, right? They have they can take you places and get you to do things that pack heavy loads. Pack heavy loads. They're just yeah. awesome. But what you have to do is you have to spend way more time with the horses. You're hunting less. Even Absolutely. if you are camped where you're hunting, you're still hunting less because of the maintenance that the horses. Well and here's I would say too, like, because we used to do long trips with horses and stuff. I grew up around horses all you you same. When you come back to camp doesn't matter if it's early in the day or late in the day. Yeah. Your horses still need to be turned out to feed, hobbled yep. or whatever. Water every day for your horses. And a horse drinks a lot of water. A lot of water. And so it's like you're cutting into your sleep, which on some of these backcountry hunts is critical. Right. You know, and so you're cutting into that sleep because you have to go feed the horses. The llamas, five minutes, feed some pellets, you're done. Yeah. Like, they're just so different in are. that regard. And I realize it's like, you know. I want to spend more time hunting and less time messing around the camp. And some mm-hmm. people love it. And I do like taking care of the llamas. But even even if you don't have llamas and you're doing it all on your back, you still have more time to hunt by mm-hmm. having llamas than if you do just backpacking. And that just comes down to, you know, they're, them allowing you to save time filtering water. If that's, mm-hmm. if, you know, because mm-hmm. if you're smart and you're really doing it the right way, you shouldn't have to worry about water for five days. And there's sometimes where you go with Mark, you know, Live safe, for yeah. example, and he's got five llamas and they're chuck full of food and beers or something, you know, <laughs> oh. and camp gear. And there's no water, so you got to worry about water. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and uh, just joking, but uh, so that's I realized they're just a really efficient way. And mm-hmm. then I realized I loved hunting with them. They were a great companion. Mm-hmm. They were quiet. They were stealthy. They saw animals before I did. And they just had this, you know, this awareness in the backcountry that I, I, a, a protection, a protection that I mm-hmm. became very fond of. Mm-hmm. And when predators were close or nearby, they would do alarm call most of the time, which you guys have seen, I think, yep, on some of your yeah. videos. And I was like, man, these these animals are just for me. Especially when the grizz is out, there's when a the certain grizz. comfort that comes from the llama being there. Yeah. Like, yes, huge, huge comfort. And you know, sometimes horses will do a pretty good job of that. And then I realized after like three or four years of packing the llamas, like, wait a second, I haven't had a rodeo. No llamas rolled over on <laughs> you me. Haven't been kicked. <laughs> haven't been kicked. Haven't broke my leg. You know, all these things that happened to me my whole life up to that point, working with horses, both on in the arenas and on the you know out in the range riding cowboy, mm-hmm. and then also in the backcountry. I was like, this is this is nice. My awareness is of like situational issues has gone way down. Stress is stress has gone down. 
and I'm and I go to and I didn't realize it until I started teaching people how to pack with llamas, and they were horse people, mm-hmm. and they're and they're like walking around the back of the llamas, getting all weird, you right. know, like they're gonna get kicked or stepped on. I'm like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. like that for me has gone away, yeah. right? But these people still have it because they work with the horses, and <clears throat> so and it's good to have that you know in your mind. But I just they're so different, and I think each one of them has their place. But for the backcountry hunter that isn't comfortable with horses, doesn't want to spend the time with them, and that can actually just come and rent the llamas and take them out, doesn't have mm-hmm. to actually own them, or the family mm-hmm. that wants to have livestock for the kids for 4-H and then also recreational packing, I don't think you can beat llamas. Yeah. You know? And then the lifespan's so long. I'll tell you, sort of my evolution was, you know, growing up with horses, doing a lot of elk hunts on horseback over the years, hunting on horseback. Um, packing elk out, deer out of like Hell's Canyon yeah. on horseback. It's tough. And the, uh, you know, the horses were a job. They were almost like a full-time gig to take care of the horses, make sure they had the water, t- high line them. Just leaving them in camp all day was a problem. Um, you had to get back and make sure they they were getting their feed and their water. They were also big And it seemed like, um, you know, I didn't, I I got to a point where I wanted to hunt more and not, not take care of horses. And it felt like horses were just that if you like horses and you love riding horses, then a big part of, I learned of, of the hunting was just an excuse to ride your horse. Was just, and my, my dad's that cowboy. He wants yeah. to kill something, but he, he loves hanging out with his mm-hmm. horses every day. Yeah. And I think them and them. if you're wired that way, then 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 it's really almost more about the horse adventure than the hunt adventure. Yeah. But I'm not. I, I'm I'm like you. I like being on the ground. I like backpacking for the reason of being fully independent, nothing but to worry about except my what's on my back and to go. Yeah. So after hunting with horses for a long time, I decided, uh, man, I just want, I just want to walk around. So for me, it was the one mule, just get the one mule. And I go in with the one mule, but the mules don't like being by themselves. Not very much. And so I'd get a mule that worked pretty good by itself, but still be getting left at camp. You know, sometimes he'd hee haw while I'm like, on they're the hill so loud. And, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm just, just like, please like, shut up. Well, and we've, <laughs> and we've had elk bugle to a mule. <laughs> yeah. Know, baying or whatever. And so but. I'm just like. Okay, so then it's two mules, and I don't need two mules. I like one. They can carry 250 pounds, yeah. 200 pounds. So, But we would kind of just walk in. But then it was still, okay, I got to high line them. I got to – or hobble them. I got to get it – you know, I got to make sure they got the food, the water. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And uh, But I started doing that, and that was kind of cool. Um, then it evolved into pack goats, and I – I got just goats at first and pretty soon I, I realized like out of six or seven goats, I had three pretty amazing goats. Yeah. The other ones were junk. Yeah. Like I just want to shoot them and leave them in the mountain. <laughs> uh, we almost did a couple of times. Like they didn't like to cross the water. Yeah. That always drove me crazy too. I'm like, what is it with the water? Goats? Yeah. And I'd have three goats who didn't care. They just do it. But the ones that didn't want to, it was like, it was a it was a rodeo they couldn't carry very much weight and they had to be in really good shape to really perform at a decent level so it means i had to hike with them all the time to get them ready and they were handy because dude i just dropped my tailgate said hop in they were like five dogs yeah and they hop right in i had some hay back there straw they they roll in i shut the tailgate i go they jump out I throw saddles on them. I didn't even have to tether them, string them together. We would hike the Eagle Caps. Oh, nice. We'd get up there pretty high. They could go anywhere we went pretty much. But they're carrying 20, 25 pounds each. Not very much weight, if that. And then um, packing out, they, you know, it was, once you loaded, a deer was fine. But you get an elk, it was like, I, I need to make still multiple trips. Yeah. Like five goats is like a guy. Two guys of weight, yeah. you know, carrying weight. And, you know, it helps, but it, it, it had its issues. And 
Uh, they they were kind of easy keepers, although they everything they could get their. So I was, was going to ask you about your goats. Were they if you're glassing? Are they in your face, like chewing on your ear and your clothes? <laughs> uh, they were. They would just follow me around like dogs. Yeah. And uh, uh, there was they they pretty much we would go to bed. I wouldn't tie them up. Um, I tie one up because they wouldn't leave that one. Yeah, tie one up, and then the rest were free to go wherever I want. And I'd wake up in the morning, you'd see them up in the cliffs, like. 200 feet up on the side of some scary sketchy ledge and you're like and all i do is just grab a little i had a little can and i put a few rocks in it and shake it like grain yeah and they come running down the mountain <laughs> and then we'd throw the saddles on them and we'd go and i make sure i always gave them like a little like nature's oat bar or something when they got down there so they knew that when they heard that sound they were going to get a little something a little reward and dude goats they're so food motivated. They'll do anything for <laughs> just a scrap. Extremely food motivated. Uh-huh. Well, almost not so much, but right. you can motivate them a little bit. And so then I would hunt with the goats. And again, it was, uh, they weren't in shape. They'd start limping. They couldn't handle the loads. We couldn't hike very far, very fast. They were, you know, a few miles and they were kind of done for the day. So that was just, um, they just weren't robust enough in the yeah. end, but they were convenient. So eventually I sort of, I mean, I had a Mustang, I had a curly horse, I had mules, I had lots of different wow. critters and, uh, and I enjoyed it all. But in the end, I'm like, there's just no perfect pack animal. I yeah. would rather backpack hunt. Uh, so I'm out. I never tried the llamas because a few friends of mine that had llamas said they sucked. Yeah. They spit, they didn't carry loads. They were, they were not good. I knew friends, people that I went to church with that had llamas and gave it a try. And they're like, so eh, no sense of going down that path. So I didn't even try. I just heard rumors from a few people that had some experience and I was out. But then, um, even, you know, I, of course I saw llamas. I saw you, I saw others with llamas online, social media and stuff over the years. And it, it perked my interest, but I kind of, dismissed it from the whole livestock situation. I don't, sure. I'm just, uh, that's a part of my life. I just takes time, takes money, takes housing, takes work. And I, I was like, you know, it's a huge commitment. I don't want to yeah. do it. You know, the, 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 the cost and the reward didn't pan out for me. Um, that ratio was too much of my time, energy, money and stuff for what I got out of it. Yeah. I'll just backpack. But then I hunted with Mark Livesey. Hmm. <laughs> How did that even come about? Uh, you know, it must man. have gone something like, oh, "I'll go with you guys, but I'm bringing my llamas." <laughs> you know, it must have been something like that. Uh, what was the first hunt with Mark? It was bear, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. It was bear. We were. That's right. So Ryan had been on a couple of jaunts with Mark, and he was impressed with the llamas. So Ryan had been saying, we need, to, we need to get Mark and go on a hunt. And mm-hmm. the place we had gone a couple of years in a row, uh, we had gone to some areas that are, you know, 15, 20 miles in, rugged, uh, water is a problem, like all sorts of things that make a pack animal attractive, but also uh, I didn't want to deal with them, yeah. you know? And so we ended up, yeah, we ended up... Uh, carving out a deal with with Livesey. he says we lured him out there <laughs> we brought our <laughs> we brought our pack rafts with us in case we had to ditch him and float home and there's a little truth in that actually yeah we and ryan brought these pack rafts they're five pounds a piece we threw on the llamas we're like yeah if the rivers swell up and mark gets stuck back there we'll just have to float out yeah because especially <laughs> especially spring bear hunting it's like you don't worry yeah. about going in, but when you're coming out and the all those snow is melting, yeah. it can change on a dime, you know. And then you got llamas. Yeah. So um, we went in and it was, it, so, so what blew my mind was um, they were easy. Mm-hmm. We got to our destination. They just laid on the ground for three or four days. They didn't even make a peep. They just sit there. Yeah. They eat a little bit. I could hardly tell they were there. Yeah. Um, Jed would like see wolves and bears before we ever did. And he'd be locked and we were like, okay, something's going on. They were quiet. They didn't make any noise. They walked quiet. Um, they, I didn't even notice, were they even being fed anything? Water? It's like they seemed to not need food and water. (laughs) And 
And then we carried a lot of weight too. And on the way in, we we had to go through some nasty country. Was it the deadfall? That yes. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were sawing trees, hand sawing stuff, and snow. Like, it was nasty. And yeah. those llamas, I'm like, They'll ne- this isn't going to work. I'm like, Ryan, this ain't going to work. There's no way. You're like, we can barely do this on our own two legs, let alone these llamas. And Mark's like, just getting them places, going over <laughs> logs. I'm like, wow. And I started to realize too, like, That's was cool. it Maverick? Yeah. I was watching that llama do. Maverick's like a, a gymnast. Like a ballerina. <laughs> like I'm watching this llama very much physically outperform yeah. the other two llamas, especially that Tux. He's a fatty. Tux is um, really. He's a little roly poly. He's yeah. a roly poly, but he's the last kid to get picked at the <laughs> playground. <you know? laughs> but he's cute. And I'm I'm watching um, Maverick really excel. He's athletic and he's carrying heavier loads. And then I'm looking at Jed and I'm like, okay, this one is the leader, calm, stable. Um, yeah, that's good words for him. You know. Uh, not as athletic, but athletic enough, controlled, didn't make mistakes, uh, you know, calming for the rest of the group. And I started to be like, wow, if you had another Jed and another Maverick in this crew, not that the other two aren't doing their job, but I could see, first of all, with Maverick, I thought, this is like a whole different animal than the other whole three. Different animal. This is a different animal that was kind of eye opening. And then I learned that that one came from you where the other ones came from hand me downs or other places he had shopped them out, yeah, you know? That's right. And I, and then Mark started to educate me on sort of your line and your breeding. And I, and I could visibly see it like yeah, plain as day, the difference. Uh, and so at that point, one hunt I was sold. I wanted llamas at that point. I'm like, Okay, I need to move <laughs> from mountain from this place to this place so I have land. I need to get this. Re- I mean, my life started to revolve around getting llamas uh, and having them be part of my life. Now I'm not getting any younger. Neither is Ryan. Our plan was a couple llamas each at least, and then between the two of us, we'd have four, and we could we could smash those mountains, um, handle some loads, get in and out. It was ideal it sounded like the perfect plan to us. And that's when I started doing more hunts with Mark yeah. and then started talking to you. So that's kind of my evolution. I'm still new, but now it's been another year and a half or so. Mm-hmm. You've done probably what, three or four more yeah, hunts? Yeah, so I've, I've actually done a lot of hunts now with Mark. Like Mark and I went on our bear hunt together, just him and I. The first one was mule deer, Ryan and, and Mark and I. That was my, I've been around llamas a little bit, but I've never hunted with them. I've never packed with them. Sure. And at the, Mark, I don't think Brian has ever had, had any experience with Gideon. I had some experience uh, with Gideon. Yeah. And at that time, you know, he was pretty, I would say reckless, but he could still pack some weight. Like, and he was getting there. And I noticed kind of the transition. So when Mark and I went on the mule you know, deer hunt together, then we did the bear hunt, you know, a few months later. Well, I guess it was two bear hunts back to back right after that. Yeah. And then he passed away you know but i kept just in those few months seeing how that llama improved and i was like dude that llama is gonna be a stud yeah and then the tick thing happened you know and, yeah that was sad and deal. but the evolution of like being around llamas kind of like you're talking yeah. and stuff i was throwing lacroix in llamas i was throwing <laughs> yeah i threw I a know. pillow in there <laughs> look you're you get spoiled real quick and what i That's learned funny. so i just got back from a multi trip we we did a bunch of elk hunting mm-hmm. uh with eli and mark and then we did uh this late season mule deer hunting um eli shot his, a cow elk and a and a buck and mark and i got a couple of bucks and uh the llamas packed us in packed us out carried all the game i used in your extreme conditions right? oh ridiculous well, i will say this mark is yet to pack out an animal that other than my bear, Mark, he hasn't packed out an animal. I've had to pack them all out of my back. So <laughs> those llamas are pretty worthless. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Because we packed out your elk on our back part of the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, but, you, you know, you, you know how you kill it a mile from camp where the llamas are at. And it's like. Might as well just. Might we well we looked at each other and we're like, yeah, camp. we're not coming back. Like, let's pack this sucker out. Yeah. 
But, I mean, we could have just hung it there and then come yeah, back the next absolutely. day and had the llamas do all the work. Absolutely. And when I'm 10 years older, maybe I'll opt for that. Yeah, but yeah. right now. <clears throat> but the point is, yeah, I've been on quite a few. Um, you did some yep. where you picked them up. Ryan has done a number now, even where he had llamas saddled for Tana to ride on. Yeah, that's right. Um, and the rental thing has been shockingly... <laughs> Well, I mean, like I, it works. I went, <laughs> I went through the, I went through the process, you know, yeah. I showed up here at your house. I picked, picked up, up the llamas. We kind of do it. You do a rundown with them. You know, this is this llama. This is that. This is for each llama. This is what you need to do. And then you're on your way. And it's like, I had them for 12 days. Yeah, you did a long time. And it's like, man, I mean, obviously I had Mark there. He has a lot of the llama experience, but it's like, those are so simple. And they saved our bacon. I mean, we had two, two grizzlies come into camp yeah. mm -hmm. that I had to shoot out of camp. So yeah. it's like, they saved our bacon, like... On multiple levels. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so we've used them extensively. Uh, on those cold hunts, for example, there was no water. Mm -hmm. They were just eating snow, I guess. Yeah. We watched them eat snow. Yeah. Uh, Mark was worried. I think it was five, four or five days that they did not have water. And um, they were eating snow, which I don't think this is ideal, but they did it, and they seemed to be fine. We got to the vehicle, and uh, we even pulled into town, got a little hotel, and Mark's trailer is really suited for four. Yeah. But he had five. five. And so he he said, you know, he felt like they needed to lay down. And, and so he didn't want to leave them in the trailer. So we just tied two of them to the side of the trailer on a sidewalk in town, and they just stood there. On the sidewalk. I mean, there's a lot of snow, but he put out some hay, and they just all laid down right there. We came back the next day. Nobody stole them. They were still there. <laughs> yeah. We're like, cool. I got these random texts from people all over Montana for like two weeks as you guys are traveling about, stopping yeah. at random like gas stations and hotels and like, you know, cul-de-sacs and like, hey, are you in Montana? I was like, nope, it's not me. And by the third, like the third occasion where you guys stopped at one little town, like yeah. the night or something. Yep. I get him a friend of mine. He's like, dude, there's llamas right next to the uh, fire station, like camped out for the night. Like, is that you? Why didn't you let me know you were in town? I was like, I'm in Colorado. This is not me. Go take a picture of him. So he takes a picture. I'm like, oh, that's Mark. And I call Mark. Hey, Mark, um, put a sign that says, I am not Bo Baby yeah. on your truck. Because I keep getting these random weird phone calls. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was with him on all those. Uh, we were sleeping in the truck overnight a few times, um, yep. just between hunts. And again, the maintenance was so low and so minimal and the llamas uh, did great. And they actually figured out how to lay down all five of them in the trailer, in the trailer. And uh, so toward the end, we needed to stop for the night and Mark was really stressed about where we might pitch them, pitch them to get them out. Yeah. Cause his trailer's not really suited for that many, but then he peeked in and they were all laying down. So he's like, Oh, okay. So we, we left them in there that night and didn't have to get them out. But typically he doesn't have to deal with that. He can just park in a parking lot. Yeah. They'll lay down inside the trailer. He's good. Um, and he can carry on. Well, I would say this too, and you, you probably have experience. Same with you is, you know, you can't put a 20 foot tether rope, stake it to the ground on with most horses. You're going to have know. a freaking wreck. Like they get it around their leg or whatever. Most I horses will, will freak out. And it's like, you put the stake in the ground, you have the 20-foot rope, you put the llamas down. Away you go. And you're gone. Like, you don't worry about it. They get tangled in a tree, they'll stand there, they'll lay down. You come back a day later. Yeah. Take, put it, it out. It is really nice. I mean, mm -hmm. and I like to Oh, look. it can't be understated. Yeah. It's no. more than really nice. It's the it's the key. <laughs> yes. It's nice. And, yeah, when you, like, you know, you drive to these places and you're like, oh, my gosh, we got snowed in or we got snowed out or. This road's mm -hmm. closed, and you start to do a lot of that. Is the more you hunt mm -hmm. in the fall, and the later you go into the season, you're running into stuff that is just out of your control. Yeah, it mm -hmm. goes from 40 degrees and raining to the next day negative, whatever, and you're like, wow. And uh, it can be really tough to have other livestock, but the llamas seem to do a lot better in those variable conditions, mm -hmm. staying in the trailer for a night if they need to. You know, like they just mm -hmm. they they don't get the stomach issues and. Ah, they just it just is a different game when you run into all those different scenarios. Yeah, so you know we kind of jumped ahead, but going back to llamas, what is 
the cost of feeding a llama, the, 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 the ease of them on the trail. Like we're kind of talking about all these things that, sure. that make the, make a case for hunters and llamas. Right. So there's going to be people listening to this podcast that are going to think I need a llama. You know, that's my thing. Sure. I remember interviewing an older gentleman. I'm drawing a blank right now. He was a guest on the podcast. I think he was 77 or 74 or something. He had two llamas. Uh, I met him at the, uh, one of these events and, uh, he'd been using llamas for about 10 years Oh, cool! and he was able to get in places and sheep hunt. He'd, do some elk, some different things where he said uh, he would have quit years ago, but he was, because he had the llamas, they extended his, his ability to hunt well into his seventies, which was impressive. Yeah. And I was looking at the guy going, how? Like <laughs> you're getting old. <laughs> yeah. And then he, that same year he went out and he did like a sheep hunt and he killed a sheep and he loaded it into his llamas and brought him back down. It was like his fifth sheep or something. And I'm like, that's crazy. Dang, man, that's impressive. So, um, yeah, tell, tell me a little more about llamas and tell me why Maverick, uh, was different than these other llamas that Mark had and maybe shed some light for the listener on why, you know, m- m- my experience, everyone had told me llamas suck, you know, yeah. why, why did I, why didn't their llamas perform like maverick like maverick you know i think you can look at horses as a whole llamas and goats and you can say well the species in general has this downfall one two and three yeah Mm -hmm. and they have these highlights one two and three and that's definitely true but llamas carried a bad reputation for a long time because people didn't understand them they were so misunderstood they there was like basically a 20 year period you could say where every llama in everybody's mind was a pack llama. Llamas were only used for one purpose and mm-hmm. that was packing and all the llamas that they were using weren't good at their job. So therefore llamas are not good for yep. packing. Yeah. Yep. And what it was is llama, people didn't realize that llamas just like goats, horses, humans were all bred different. Mm-hmm. And, and you evolve. And, and we evolve. Like there's race horses and then there's yep. cold blood draft horses built for work. Yep. Right. And then there's Arabians and there's Mustangs and then there's Horses that are used in the rodeo circuit that are bred specifically yep, yep. for being really fast, really and agile, right? And so it's like, well, can you take a full draft horse 20 miles into the Frank Church with X amount of weight and do really well year in and year out? Probably not, yeah. right? Right, yeah. right. And so people were expecting llamas that weren't bred to be pack llamas to be pack llamas. And they carried a really bad reputation. And the, the saddest thing I think that happened is that the, the big time users of horses and outfitters, they're like, oh, this llama idea, and this, we're talking 80s and 90s, right? Right. It's brilliant. This could really, really work well for me, the concept of mm-hmm. it. And they were pretty open minded to it and they tried it out. But they were buying llamas for 100 bucks, 500 bucks that were trained, but were never meant to be on the trail structurally confirmation they were not meant to be on the trail and so they'd give up on them really quick because the llamas couldn't perform so these are llamas more bred for coat or for or mixed meat breeds or, or whatever mm-hmm. yeah okay someone's like someone they wouldn't work for their purpose in the show ring for example or for meat or for wool production yep and so they're like you know we'll just sell it as a pack llama for 500 bucks because mm-hmm. it's trained and so some outfitter this is a common story. This is why I use outfitters, but people across the, the mm-hmm. West would buy this llama for 500 bucks and it has a nice disposition and it's easy to be around and it leads well, but they put some weight on it. It goes a half a mile and gives up, stops and spits and stubborn won't get up. Mm-hmm. And it was because they were expecting like, for example, like a poodle to go out there and, you know, perform at, um, a sheepdog yeah. competition. Mm-hmm. And it's like, wait a second. And so it was really sad because people were really open to the idea and concept in the eighties and nineties right. and they gave it a fair shake and had horrible, horrible experience in general. Mm-hmm. I imagine it'd be like my goat experience. You know, I Three felt goats. like I needed to buy like 12 goats to get four good ones. Yeah. And you'd, the only way to know is to get them, try them, work them. And there were some that just were, sh- I was like, if I could just clone these two, yeah. I would have, I would have an incredible string. Yeah. And so I ended up on this pursuit of finding goat packers and I go into, I, I, I joined a pack goat club Yeah, (laughs) and we would like meet and some of these breeders have been 
breeding for mixing like a boar with a, with a dairy goat and try to make the goats bigger Stronger. so they could carry more yeah. weight, last longer, but still keep, you know, these characteristics. And so they were on the quest to breed a goat that could pack weight. Mm -hmm. But the more I thought about it and looking back now, thinking of llamas versus goats, you know, llamas have been bred to pack for four or 5,000 years. Yeah. I mean, goats, thousands, thousands of years. Goats have never been. Goats were never used as a animal to carry loads. Primarily they were used bred to me. milk or to Food, eat. Yeah. And so, uh, you're, t you're, you're at a, I don't know, a three or 4,000 year disadvantage when right. you try to make a goat into a pack animal That's right. versus a llama. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I had to come to that realization. I was like, okay, so I realized at one point, you know, 2009, 10, I was like, llamas have been bred for thousands of years to pack. Well, how come six of the ones I have won't work with the crap and two of them will? Mm -hmm. And so I started basically in my own mind reverse engineering. It's like, okay, I've got this one that works really good. Why mm -hmm. does he work good? And I looked at his body and I looked at his move and his biomechanics and I started breaking it down. And then I realized that all through the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, there was already a group of people that have been on the quest to find and refine great working llamas in North America. Right. And so when I, once I became in touch with those people, um, I started buying llamas all throughout North America, going all over the place trying to buy the, their animals. Their breeding line. Or their whatever. breeding lines. Mm. And I found a lot of lost lines, and we you know, ended up finding a lot that were going to be lost because baby boomers owned them, and they had died, and their kids had the llamas, and they were just feeding them until they died because it was mom and dad's request. Yeah. And I bought llamas all over the place for a lot of money. And I think that we have about half of what we bought is represented here now today, and the rest of the genetics have, have gone and died. And when we bought them, they were just too old. You know, they just mm. couldn't reproduce. And so there's a lot of genetics that are gone, but what we have here today is pretty remarkable. And yeah. so we took basically generations of work and then combined it all into this, like, melting pot of genetics. And then what we did is we tested it on the trail. And if it couldn't work at a high capacity on a commercial string, which is basically a thousand miles a year, mm -hmm. you know, you start, we start early in March and we go all the way through November, a little bit into December. And over that period of time, most of our packers will reach a 1K. And uh, the, one, the younger animals will reach, you know, three to 500 miles in the season. But by the time they're six or seven, they've got a couple thousand miles under the belt. And then we know, okay, this is a standout llama. Is it a breeder? Yeah. And there's a lot of llamas that can't, that we had initially that could never do a thousand mile season, mm -hmm. let alone two or three. So, so in a row. I'd ask you too, like what in your breeding lines, like what do you expect out of your llamas to be able to pack this much weight for this many days to, to, for them to be like a good breeding llama? You know, when they're, when we're, when they're five to six years old is when we expect to really see what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. And we expect 80 pounds, a standard of 80 pounds. And that doesn't include the saddle, right? We just never yeah, yeah, include that. Yep, so, yep. and some people are like, well, eighty pounds. So the saddle's you know ten to twelve, and that means you know you're sixty eight to seventy pounds. No, which is a the saddle it's plus eighty pounds, 80 of, weight pounds of weight adding. that we're going on top mm -hmm. of the llama. And we expect them to basically do that um, for one hundred and twenty days, with you know periodic breaks in between as they rest and go from one location to the next, and it equals about a thousand miles. Oh yeah, and uh, so that's what we expect. And if they can do that in a season. Typically, they'll be able to do that. But the real goal is to see them do that over a 10-year season, right? Mm -hmm. And But they by the time they do that and you breed them, you know, they're 15 years old. So you got to kind of to realize the greatness early on in mm -hmm. their career because you got to get them breeding because yeah. they're not going to live forever. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is just basically test them really, really hard on the trail and breed the best. And we look for athleticism, endurance ability their movement is really important how their body moves one with another and it's like you look at basketball athletes you know nba players are really good people to look at for like genetics and ability and athleticism there's so many different from a, yeah. a center down to a guard mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of different body profiles and with llamas there's a lot of different body profiles that still fit the bill and so when you mix in your match and you look at the genetics on each side it all comes down to you know, their performance on the trail and then their genetics. And once they've got it, then you, you know, and we've got llamas that are 50 inches tall at the shoulder mm -hmm. down to llamas that are 46 inches tall at the shoulder. 
that are all performing at this high level. Okay. And, uh, and the ideal llama for me is somewhere in the middle of those two, but it all comes down to like endurance performance. And then you can start breaking it down to, well, this llama is this hot, hot, this tall weighs this much and looks like this, you know, he looks more like a, um, a wrestler versus a, a guard in the NBA. Yeah. And you'll see those tall, long, skinny <clears throat> ones. And you'll see the ones that have really heavy bone and more muscle. Yeah. You know, like, there's just different I was going to notice, styles. like, some of them, you know, like, take some at Mark's Llama, you know, he's kind of skinnier, smaller bone, and then you take even, you know, Maverick's a little bigger, obviously, but then, like, some of the ones that I had taken from you, yeah, I'm like, this Llama looks like a, he's Shaq, yeah. you know, but yeah. athletic, I mean, he's big, you know? And that's what we and, want, because they got to take a, think about it, they, they handle 70% of their body weight on the front end, mm-hmm. and so when yeah. llamas go downhill, their chest and their front legs just take a beating. Right. And if they're going to take a beating for 15 years, they've, it's got to be built. Mm-hmm. And the only way they can handle it day in and day out and not give up and not burn down and lay on you is just to be able to have the, the right body composition. Yeah. And when you go to Peru, some places in Argentina and some places in Bolivia and look at the working llamas that are there, you're like, ah, this is what 6,000 years of breeding mm-hmm. made. And we have animals that are very comparable to animals that are in South America but their best are probably not quite, are a little bit better than our best. But our best are pretty dang good. Yeah, you know, yeah. they're and they're a little bit different body styles. Really, it's very interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, that's so fascinating. It's so fascinating to learn about them as a species in general. And when I um, went on the first hunt, then I, I got home. I was super curious, and I started reading about llamas. Yeah, I put a little facts up in the video, <laughs> like. Hey, did you know llamas could are like this and they yeah. have this and they have that? Like how far can they see? What is their vision like? What are their hearing like? What what is unique about them? Those are fun questions. They are yeah. bizarre animals. Very much so. When you look like, at it, you're like, how did a llama evolve evolution and dude, to get to where they are today? Dude, dude, I said on the video, <laughs> it makes no sense that these things are like the one thing I didn't realize was the llama isn't necessarily a wild animal. It's a domesticated animal. Yep. Because I look at that llama, and I'm like, dude, that thing is grizzly bait, mm-hmm. man. At the end of the day, it can bark and scream and do all its things, but it ain't going to run away like a deer. It's right. not going to do this, this, this. You know, it's got its um, – I, I was sitting there going, all these years, and this is what evolution came up with? Like, <laughs> it just was a little bit – so I was like, there's something I'm missing. What is it about those llamas that made them survive to this, to where we are today? Yeah. You know, I could see in a horse, I can see in, uh, you know, in a dog and, uh, you know, I'm looking at a llama going, but a chihuahua is not, it, it, evolu- evolution. Yeah, they it got disconnected it, there somewhere. <laughs> like if a chihuahua, if that's, that's funny. not evolution. That was human beings. And human I, error. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right. you look at a wolf and you're like, there's evolution. There, There's like nature. Right. There's nature. And over here you have humans. And so then I, then I started to realize, okay, llamas are a little bit of both. You know, they, they have that human hand in what they are today. And when I started to look back at, you know, kind of the precursor to the llama and things like that, you get, you get back to a critter that's more like the wolf to the dog. Yeah. Makes more sense Very to much me. So. What yeah. is an, isn't a llama like one of the only animals animals that can like actually kick forward? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty amazing. When you watch a llama in the wild or a guanaco, yeah. which llamas derive from mm-hmm. guanacos, right? You watch them in the wild, and they're you're like, wow! Like it's like hunting, trying to hunt whitetails, like the most alert whitetails yeah. mm-hmm. in wide open spaces. Like, and that's good luck. That's and they're not the, massive. Right? They're like small. They're small and they're extremely strong and like. If you've ever wrangled llamas before and you grab one by the neck, it's like there is no possible, physically possible way that mm-hmm. you can hold on to it. Oh, that's untrained, yeah, right? right? An adult llama, you can't. It doesn't matter how strong you are, how big you are. And you're like, oh, they, they move like a slinky. And it is insane. <laughs> They're so strong and they just throw you, you around some like of a rag doll. Videos, you're like, they'll have a cat on top. Then there's wild llamas or whatever. And they'll have a cat on top of it. And as that cat like goes to clinch down on its neck, they. Like jar, but, jar, but their neck, neck and everything just, and if the cat flips over and then they get back on. Yep. The way they but, move that neck is insane. But their eyesight, that's one thing I noticed right away. Yeah. Mark and I, we'd, we'd had to go down into a canyon to get water. It was like, mm-hmm. the, it was frozen temperatures, negatives. And there was one spot that we found that had some actually running water. And this is like on day six or seven. So we, we needed water. 
and we go down in there and we're in that can- canyon and we, we had taken, I think we had took two llamas down there. And what I noticed right away was as those llamas went further down into that canyon, they were on high, high alert, high alert. like searching everywhere. And I noticed, I noticed their eyesight before, but when they got down there, one, their alertness, but their eyesight was just incredible. Like we had a, a deer walk across and instantly just, poof, they were yeah. on it. You yeah. Know? yeah. We wouldn't have seen that. And when you watch them in the wild too, they're that way. And I think that's why they evolved to what they are is mm-hmm. they just have, they just had to have really good senses yeah. and their eyesight and People always ask me, "Is like, how come my llamas won't drink in the backcountry when I go to a stream? I was like, honestly, one of, this is my take, right? And they will if they're thirsty. Yeah. But that's where they get ambushed. That's their weakness. Mm-hmm. That's in the wild. That's how they get, you know, yeah. eaten up is by going to water. And also, like, people ask, well, why do llamas pee and poop when you go to a stream or a creek crossing? And I think that there's their way of staying clean and getting rid of scent. Yeah. You know, like, they're so risk adverse that they do just do whatever they can to stay alive. And I think they've evolved into these things and yeah. now even so heavily domesticated, yeah. they're still extremely alert, extremely aware. You take llamas down to a Canyon oh, yeah. with low escape routes mm-hmm. next to none, you know, high low pro- visibility, low visibility, high probability of ambush. And they're like, this does not no, feel right. right. <laughs> like the <laughs> whole know? time we're filling up the buckets and water. I mean, they were like making noises and like, the, it's almost like a cat purr or something, yeah. you know? And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> And back it's like and you forward. walked into their death. You yeah, know, yeah. Know it. it's and funny. but as soon as we got out of there, was, they relaxed. They started walking out. You know, and, and yeah. it's just different. But. So that's kind of like why llamas and like a lot, a little bit about why not every llama is a pack llama. I used to write articles all over the place in every college newspaper, every local newspaper, all over Craigslist, Facebook. I used to be heavily, heavily involved, and I just was trying to explain to people when I first got started, because I used to get crap. Mm -hmm. Llamas suck. My dad had them. My grandpa had them. My neighbor had them, and they laid down on them. They spit, and they won't get back up, and they won't go very far. And I was like, man, I have to... I have to retrain people's minds and get rid of this this idea that you know every yeah. llama's a pack llama and the pack llamas suck. And right. it was really hard. So I spent the first part of my, you know, ranch and career just focusing on that, letting people know that every llama's a pack llama and they should be willing to give llamas a mm-hmm. second try. And I would do free clinics and people would come to the ranch and we'd go hiking and I do free llama rentals and I did so much stuff just <laughs> to get this idea yeah. that they could work. Well it know? surprises me how calm llamas are and not obnoxious. Every animal I've ever taken with me places has been obnoxious. At the end of the day, the goats, they're making noise, the horses, the mules, like everything is sort of like annoying me. Literally, Mark's llamas will lay down and chew all day. Mm -hmm. I'm like, did he get up? Did you see him get up? Like, yeah. And, and, um, you know, Mark has explained to me how they have a they they kind of like to conserve energy. Like they're not a high strung animal; they're like a really key, low, key low key animal. I think when you look at the three goats, horses, and llamas, if you spend extensive time in the backcountry, llamas feel most at home in the backcountry, mm-hmm. and then they just feel like that they just have less need to be, you know. Like less ego, for example. Yeah, like they just totally. Like, I'm back here. I'm with I you. Mean, it's fine. Look I don't at need sheep and goats. They're always kicking each other in the balls and like trying to ram <laughs> each, each other goes. off a hill. And like they're they're just obnoxious. Yeah, when you watch wild horses, you're like watching them. You know, yep. like in Nevada on the plains, and all of a sudden you talk to your buddy, you grab a drink of Pepsi. And next thing you know, the horses are going 50 yes. miles an hour that way. And you're like. What are they doing? And the next thing you know, they're jumping the fences and coming up and trying to figure out what you are. You're like, yeah, you guys are literally all over the place. Yeah, and it's just who they. It's just and what they, they fight. Are. Yeah, I read about horses years ago, and they were saying like horses on average will travel like a hundred miles a day or something insane. It's insane, and that's like how they like to go. Yeah. They go from that water hole. They they just never stop walking. Never stop walking. A lot like wolves in that way. And then you put them in a pasture, and it's like the most antithetical thing to their health. Right. I read some stuff about how they would put horses on racetracks basically. And as long as the horse couldn't see, like they actually will walk in circles all day long Mm -hmm. and actually prefer like what's around the corner, what's around the corner than a traditional square pasture where they'll just stand in the corner. If they can see all the way to the other side, they just don't move. They just don't move. And there's a benefit to them walking all day. It's actually their hooves help pump as well as, uh, I guess, a horse's hoof uh, pumps blood. Mm-hmm. So in addition to their heart, yep. their feet 
yeah. contribute as well. And, and you, it's like, you know, shooting horses and stuff. You can tell a healthy horse by a healthy hoof. That's right. Yeah. You know, if, if they're not. Now, one thing that I struggled with with goats was <clears throat> it seemed like they're, and I was in Oregon, on the coastal side, kind of Oregon City. Rainy. It's wet, wet, rainy, muddy. And we threw a lot of concrete in there, just piles of concrete and rock. So they would Wasn't just so muddy. Yeah, and they just love to climb up on all that stuff and yeah. ram each other off the top of it. And so <laughs> we just had, but there was mud in between. But they just ended up spending time on all these giant rock piles. Yeah. Uh, but their hooves were just a pain in the. Ass. Yeah. So definitely, goats have the worst foot care out of all of the, th- the three, mm-hmm. you know, major pack species for sure. And uh, it was constant. I had to cut them. Yeah. Work on them. them. Take care of them. Yeah, they we, get hoof we, rock. Uh, in the spring, we were. Mark had hadn't got to it, so on the trail, like at the trailhead, we were cutting llama <laughs> feet, you know, trimming them down. That's but funny. How, how much work is a llama in comparison to a goat? Is that's my reference. Um, goats are substantially more. Okay. Yeah, and uh, they also probably have more issues with their feet than mm-hmm. llamas do. Like working llamas, our males will trim twice a year. We'll try it once. Oh, that's in, it. Once in the spring, and then runs right before winter. And, nice. that, and that's okay. it. And we're horses, you're, you know. Every six, eight weeks. Six, usually. eight, nine weeks, somewhere in yeah. there. And goats, you know, varies depending on what kind of terrain they're in, what kind of feed they're getting, how old they are. Um, there's so much that varies. And um, so that's, the, the go- llamas are the easiest when it comes to foot care. What about feed and, and uh, housing and stuff? You know, a three-sided shelter, for example, is pretty ideal in most places. And this is a good example. Like today, it was negative 13 when we woke up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's December. We've got uh, barley for bedding straw. And we plan on 10 pounds per llama per day of feed throughout the winter. And that's, you know, we lose a little bit of storage waste, uh, feed waste during storage and then through feeding process. And so really they're getting somewhere between six and eight pounds per llama. And this is an adult llama. Mm-hmm. And so roughly about $400 a year is what we plan on for hay. Per llama. Per llama. And, and we're basically budgeting for six, six or seven months worth of hay. And then we pasture them the rest of the time. Right. And so very similar to what a goat would be. And, you know, about a third of what a normal average size thousand pound horse would be, mm-hmm. you know. So with goat, you don't want to give them too much uh, rich food. You know, they're more of um, just a grass. Nice fibrous feed, yeah. Yeah. So what, what are goat? What are llamas? You know, a lot of people say don't give llamas rich feed. And when you really dive into it, like when you take away an animal's natural diet, which llamas would be very similar to mule deer, and mm-hmm. you can actually use llamas in the backcountry to help you figure out what are the mule deer eating. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's like watch your llama from the trailhead to your campsite. Watch what they go and choose first, second, and third to eat All when right. it's available to them, and then your mule deer are going to be right in line. Interesting. And mm. so as you watch that vegetation as you're hunting and glassing, it's like, okay, let's find, you know, mullein or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, look, there's mule deer over there. Yeah. No wonder, yeah. right? Right. And all animals in the backcountry, including llamas, like they're feed oriented. They wake up and they think food, water, shelter, mm-hmm. survive. Yeah. And we think other things, you know, <laughs> especially as men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, basically what it comes down to is, you know, as much, you know, the feeding, you're right around 10 pounds a day, $400 a year, and keeping them three sided shelter is pretty ideal. And we have these. You know, water, clean, clean water is good. They're, if you're looking to really save money, they have these things called drinking post Mm -hmm. and we have them for our llamas and they're made out of Colorado and the llamas press on a little valve, water comes up, they drink it and then it drains. So in the summer, water is 40, 45 degrees in the winter, water is 40, 45 degrees. You don't have to clean them. Birds aren't taking baths. There's no parasites. Mm -hmm. There's no algae. And so it's just really effective way to do it. And so once you're set up with the llamas, three-sided shelter, a good fence. And I tell people, it's like, llamas are way easier to keep in than goats and horses. And the thing is, is as long as they have food, they're not going to pressure a fence. Yeah. And you can have a 40-inch fence and be just fine. Mm. Right now, I've got a 40-acre pasture that we hurried and fence. We got a really nice fence post in, but we didn't have enough money to pay for the wire. Mm. And I had this old smooth strand wire. I got three strands, and they're about this far apart. Yeah. Couldn't llamas go through that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Super, super yeah. easy. Have they? 
not in four months, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and there's just no need. They just don't press the fences like goats and horses. Now, right. are you are you some of those fences? Are they hot fences? You know, because like a horse, you can keep mm-hmm. a horse in with a single strand hot fence. Yeah, you know? and I, if you said hey, this is my goal, I'm gonna keep my llamas in with a single strand hot fence. Is like don't do it. Yeah, but if you have to use a hot fence because you're not ready yet, do a three strand and do ribbon. Don't do wire. Yeah, right, right. And then you'll be just fine. Right. And whether that's on or not it is probably going to keep them in. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and right. it's, it's the barrier more than it is the hot. Fence. Yeah. It's like most horses. You take one strand and they hit it once when it's hot and then you turn it off and they're, they're not yeah. going to hit it again. Yeah. yeah. They don't forget. How much space do they need? You know, it, it all depends. Like if you're going to feed them year round on kind of like a dry lot situation where there's not really any pasture, you know, two to three llamas per acre on a dry lot is, is good. You're feeding hay year round, you know, but if you're trying to, if you have irrigated ground here, like in the, in the western quarter, Montana, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, mm-hmm. if you have irrigated ground, you can usually get four to five llamas per acre um, okay. on pasture, and they, they could do really well on it. And so it all kind of depends, you know, on yeah. your situation. I mean, people, we have people that own llamas in South Dakota and North Dakota and other places, and, and the forage is so different over there. Let's talk about the temperatures. Um, you know, we were in you know, zero degree temps with the llamas for days. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, I wanted to be inside a shelter. <laughs> they just laid there and got snowed on. Yeah. Um, what can they take? Like what's, you know, if they're working like that and you're keeping the process they can feed, I think it's one of the most important things. Llamas can handle extreme cold temperatures, but they also have to be processing feed, you know? And yeah, so yeah. their stomach, the room it will keep them warm. As long as they're processing it's like feed, cattle you got to the, through the cold, you up the yep. feed amount, you know, yep. or hot, hot more or hot even feed. deer, I deer, mean, yeah, yeah. And, and so they got to be on their feet. Like, well, mule deer act different in negative twenty seven than they do when it's zero. Yeah, yeah. they have to stay moving. They got to keep their bellies going. And same with the llamas. So llamas do. If you said, what do they do better in hot or cold? Definitely, I would say the cold. And once you get into nineties, you know, and you're working them hard on exposed slopes to the sun, it's like that's going to be really rough for them. Yeah. And they're going to need to stay hydrated and get them in the shade and cool them down for the breaks. And so when it comes to long Spring bear was the, that was our challenge was the heat. Um, the cold this year didn't seem to bother them much. So what no. you're saying is llamas are exactly like Ryan Lampers. The heat <laughs> crushes them. <laughs> yeah. The heat will crush them and you just have to be smart. Like if you're in the summer, it's July and it's 95 and you drive over to, you know, Sun Valley mm-hmm. and you start hiking at noon. And you've got three miles of no shade. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. rough for yeah. everybody. Right. And so I just tell people, like, treat them like an eight-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going to have your kid out there and they're going to be beating them down the sun, and it's like, just think of that. Yeah. Shade up, water. Yeah. And, you're, it, and it's cold. Well, i got an eight-year-old kid and it's freezing cold. How do I need to take care of my kid? So, you know, and that's just a really good, like, rule of thumb. Yeah. So when I've been with Mark in these later seasons and there's, uh, you know, we're abandoning ab- – abandoning these uh, guys at camp while we spike out and hunt all day. Mark comes back. He's got these pellets that he gives them. Mm -hmm. What's that about? Basically, it's just kind of like us. Like when you go into the back country and you're, you're breaking down your food. Okay. We're trying to stay light, have enough nutrition, Mm -hmm. but a lot of times you miss some of the, you know, the vitamins and minerals that your body needs. And so after like a 10 day hunt, all of us come out of the back country and have one thing on our mind. Like I want X milkshake, eat, milkshake, <laughs> or hamburger, greasy fries. burger. You're like, yeah. you, you, your mind goes to where your body needs it to go. Yeah. And so when the llamas are back there, think about they work this trip, next trip, next trip, next trip. And so when they start working in the spring for llamas like Mark has and I have, they're always going. And so the the pellets that we give them <clears throat> basically replace what they're not getting um, in the field that they okay. need at home. Mm-hmm. And so just make sure they're getting all the vitamins, all the minerals that they need. And then gives them a, a protein supplement and a little extra fat. And so it just helps them day in and day out on a 120-day to 150-day season have the right nutrients to keep going and working. So one thing I want to ask, Bo, is, you know, because we ran into this situation last spring. And it was actually pretty detrimental to one of Mark's llamas. So we didn't know this. I didn't know this at all. Um, so say you're starting a spring hunt, you have llamas. What are your precautions that you take as far as tick preparedness, getting them ready for the hunts in the spring to kind of continue on through the summer. Yeah. What do you kind of do? Yeah. So in the spring, they're ready to start losing their undercoat. So most, the best breeds of, of working llamas are called Cara llamas. And it basically translates to without wool and they're dual coat. So they have mm-hmm. undercoat and then they have a guard hair. And so in the spring, if it's 
April or on, I'm like, okay, they can do without their undercoat for the most part. So I'll mm-hmm. start to brush that out. Oh, yeah. Right? Brush that coat out, get rid of the burrs so they don't get saddle sores. I'll make sure their feet are trimmed and ready to go. Make sure they've got the yearly vaccinations, which is about a $6 shot per llama. Mm-hmm. Do it uh, twice a year typically. And then I'll bring in fly spray for them and give them a shot of Ivamec because around here, the spring is heavy, heavy ticks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the Ivamec helps the, la- the llamas for when they do get ticks on them. They usually don't attach or stay on for very long. And so for like people, because like I said, I didn't know. I didn't know how susceptible llamas are and how bad of a reaction they can have to ticks, especially yeah. a lot of ticks. It's like this. is like, well, mule deer and elk are also very susceptible, but if they lay down somewhere... They, and it's tick infested, they'll fill them and they'll be able to move or go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Well, llamas, when you get to camp, you're there for, let's say, five days. Yeah. And you don't know because they're not communicating. Hey, Brian. Hey, Mark. Right. I got ticks everywhere, bro. Yeah. yeah. You know? And so what you'll do is. And I have sat down with lampers like on a rock pile, you know, overlooking a, a ridge for for bears or something. And I will literally have hundreds of ticks descend on us, yeah. you know, and. One time on Ryan, I picked, he put his hood on and I had a Ziploc bag. No way. And I just picked off, I didn't know how many we'd collect. It it was hundreds of ticks in a little bag in about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And they just, for some reason they'd crawl up his body and they'd all just get on his hoodie. Hood, yeah. Um, And uh, that's just a spot we ought not sit very long, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And I I can see where we'd sit in other spots and there's no ticks. No ticks. And so... What makes them, you know, thrive in a certain spot? I don't know, but um, I can easily see how how you could get overwhelmed as you know if you're a llama and you get parked on one of those spots, dude. Yeah, it can get overwhelmed quickly, and and the key is just prevention. Mm-hmm. You know, the permethrin is huge. There's a it's called CDS permethrin two, and you can put it on your pants, you know, on your gaiters from mm-hmm. knee down. It really, really helps. And it's an oil base. And so it stays on the llamas for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And if you do that every two weeks that you're going out with the llamas with one annual, you know, spring vaccination of Ivamec, mm-hmm. the llamas are going to do great and they're not going to have any issues. Yeah. You still need to check them, but it's highly unlikely that ticks are going to attach or stay on at all. Yeah. And so and Mark just somebody that doesn't know, like if they're not treated, you know, beforehand, you can probably explain much better, like what can happen with the llama and why it happens, you know? Because, yeah. like I said with Mark, he lost that one llama. He lost Gideon, yeah. Yep. So we're talking. He almost about, lost a bunch. I almost lost a yeah. bunch, yeah. Jed and, has lifelong llama, everything. Yeah. It's really scary. And so you just have to, prevention's the key. And if llamas get overwhelmed with ticks, mm-hmm. it just would be like you, you know, like anything that gets a you know, 50, 100, 60, or even 10 ticks and they yeah. stay on there for a long while, it's going to bring you down. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens to llamas is you get in the back country, you don't have any kind of prevention for them. They get 60 to 150 ticks on them, sucking them down. That happens for five days. Then you load them heavy and say, hey, bud, we're going eight miles with 80 pounds. And they're already broke down. Mm-hmm. And now you break them down even further. Yep. And uh, now your llama gets home and it's struggling to stay alive, struggling to breathe. Yeah. You know, and he, did, he did explain, though, uh, when he did give them an injection, it was like the ticks just gone it's almost like they they're like poured off of them yeah yeah so it's an effective measure very and and that was the hardest part mark said about the whole experience was a simple little shot before he walked out would have saved everything all the heartache yep yeah um but you know you get busy and you think ah it's not that big a deal yeah um and uh it, it it took him a while to figure out what was going on yeah and um well, so that's, I mean, we, we'd done a 10 mile day on the way out that day coming home. Yeah. Not in well, he thought it was a lot train. of other things like heat and whatever. Yeah. Didn't, Didn't drink enough or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's what you start to go to. And my instinct now over the years, is like, oh, it's spring. And Mark called me. I'm like, check for ticks. He's like, there's no way. I'm like, just please just do this two things and to all of them real quick. And then check for ticks after that. Because yeah. if you don't do this and they do have it, we're in big trouble. But if you do it and they don't, then no harm, no foul. Right, right. It's like, let's go into prevention and then we'll worry about what the actual cause is in a minute. And anyway, so there's just things like that, you know, with all livestock that you got to know. And the springtime can be really scary, you know, when, because, you you know, the rivers, yep, deadfall, you know, slides. I had a slide a couple of times come down. We hike in, then we get back. It's like, 
How are we getting home? There's yeah. like you know? the, the springtime is a lot more challenging than I think people realize. Super challenging. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of guys, it's it's warmer. It's only getting warmer generally by the day. Yeah. yeah. But it comes with all sorts of. And we've seen it. You know, like, you can cross a river, go shoot a bear, and you come back, and in half a day, that river can be up a foot. Yeah. And it's 30 feet wide. Like, dude, Ryan and I like, went in one time. We crossed a river. It was like knee deep and it was sketchy. When we came back, it was over your head flowing like, like, a, you know, like Niagara Falls. Yeah. Um, we had to, we had to blow up rafts. There's no waiting across. You'd die. Uh, and if, and then with the rafts, you had to hit the mouth of the, you know, you had to cross down where it re- hit the big river, the runoff. And then if you didn't get through that runoff and you hit the big river, you were going down a slot canyon of death of oh sheer, gosh. like, mm-hmm. concrete, like, walls and and uh, waterfalls and, and you're dead. So you got to make the pull out, you know. And it was <laughs> – I was like, like, you think in the winter times when it's dangerous, but the spring has all kinds it of uh, challenges. challenges. And, and, the, and the tick issue is really only – I have only – experienced that really through june after that even july and august has been pretty mild i've seen with ticks yeah but but by the time you hit the winter you know by the time you hit late august i hardly ever yeah. have a tick issues and then into september october november it's it's really a spring issue it's springtime for sure yeah and that's <clears throat> there's actually a couple of businesses over the years that i ran into that rent llamas and like they thought told me i was crazy you rent llamas in the spring it's like oh yeah you just got to do this. And they, they're like, you're crazy. I'm like, well, I want to be out in the spring. The llamas want to get out in the yeah. spring. There's all these. It's one of my favorite It's just like a new grass. time of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's know? like, no, we're going and this is what this is how we're going to manage it. Well, I want to get into that. I want to do another podcast with you. Um, I would like to know kind of, let's say a guy, two things. A guy sitting here and he's like, I want a llama. I think I might want to buy one. I think I might want to own one. Um, um, what What's your kind of step-by-step advice for that? Yeah. And uh, the second one is, look, I'd love to own one. I just can't, but I want to use them. What's this rental thing all about? And yeah. I want to get into that because I'd like to hear kind of, um, <clears throat> I want you to allay the fears of a, of a guy, a couple of buddies who, who want to rent and are a little like unsure of, sure. of such mm-hmm. a thing. And the third thing I want to touch on is um, the system that you have for backpacking in terms of um, your llamas and your shelters, um, the sort of uh, method for feeding, taking care of them. Kind of, it kind of goes along with the rental thing. Yeah. And, um, and get into that. So I want to add one thing <clears throat> like for the why, you know, llamas. That's kind of what we focus yep. on is like why llamas. And so I would think for me, after being around them, much more than the past and being around other animals. I think I, why I would consider llamas is safety protection, mm-hmm. the ease of them when it comes to feeding and taking care of them at camp. And then I would say the third thing is the packability, you know, because mm-hmm. they can pack 70, 80 pounds when they're in shape. Yeah. Good shape, you know, and, and that's, you get a couple of them and that's a lot of weight. It's a lot of weight. You yeah. know, I would, I would argue to, yeah, I would say that they can go, almost yeah. anywhere mm-hmm. um where horses i feel like would have struggled we were able to take llamas yeah and the second thing is uh if i compare them to goats especially they have a longevity that goats don't have yeah you know true. you're waiting four or five years for a goat to be really packable and then he's only got four or five years or less before he's done yeah and uh the lifespan of a llama is a totally different situation yeah much more comfortable to horses yeah 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 so let's get into that next time um okay but yeah thanks guys. Oh, thanks for coming on the podcast i don't Appreciate know if we it. covered anything valuable but i was like it's fun <laughs> hey, now we're talking. Uh, hey you answered my question yeah, this is exactly. my selfish show anyway exactly. all i do is uh put headsets on people and cool. get information so this yeah, is great like we're on, like on a spaceship you know, about to take <laughs> off. thank you guys i appreciate yeah. that thank it's, you these things really help our little business grow and just American made, family owned, and we make mistakes well, now and then, but try hard to yeah. provide From a good product, Going through you know? the experience of actually like the llama breakdown and rental and stuff, like you guys make it very, yep. very easy. I mean, from yep. 
the conversation to pick up to drop cool. off. That's it's nice it's, to hear. Awesome. How, how do people get a hold of you? Go to our website, wildernessridgetraillamas.com, or they can go to rentlamas.com. Okay. And our website's, you know, kind of the best way. We also, we don't really use social media very good. <laughs> we should do better. And, uh, or just give us a call. Our web, our phone number's on the website. Okay. And uh, pretty much people call in and they'll talk almost always to me or to, uh, we have one office assistant. And so we have and the website calls. is www. Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas. Dot com trail on wilderness yep. ridge so we'll, trail make, we'll have it in the description com. for everybody we'll put it in the description sh- field of uh our youtube video of this podcast you can yep. check that out there but uh you do have an instagram right yep we do uh we, we just don't what's it called it's uh wilderness it's wilderness ridge trail llamas trail llamas. same thing same thing yep yep okay yeah you won't you probably won't see anything on it because it's totally <laughs> inactive a little bit like my instagram <laughs> We get like ten posts a year. Uh, I just wish I wish we were better at it, but I don't know. We just focus on the llamas and the yeah. business and people, and yeah. and we're just not good at it. I so. mostly focus on uh, just film on YouTube and long form, like with podcasts. I social media is not my thing. Um, I've enjoyed it in the past. There are times in my life I feel like it's not what it used to be. You know, with the censorship and some of the uh, manipulation that happens on social media. Yeah. Um, it's funny cause I used to like scroll through and I'd see all the things I'm interested in and, uh, I'd see friends and people that did stuff I'm interested in. Now I scroll through and I see things that I think the government wants me to be interested in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally different things. Totally different things. And I'm not interested in those things. And yeah. so social media has, uh, I'm out, I'm done. Yeah. So that, that's kind of how I see social media. That's interesting. Um, you know, I see that too. And. I just haven't had the, they just never appealed to me, you know? And I think maybe it's because when I got into, when social media came out, I was in Argentina. Yeah. You know, and it took off and I came home like, I don't understand, you know, <laughs> swiping what? Left and right. It's like, you met a girl on what thing? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Like, what is an app? Hey, I'm, I'm way you know? older than you, dude. Uh, when I was in, I was in Japan on a mission. Oh, wow. And I was there in 94, 95. I mean, Al Gore hadn't even invented the internet yet. <laughs> So, uh, I think 96, a friend of mine, uh, someone came into the field and said, oh yeah, I sent my first email. I'm like, what's email? They're like, it's like this electronic message. I was writing on paper and putting it in an envelope with a stamp stamp, to send letters home from Japan. Um, there was no internet email or anything like that. So. I feel like Bo and I are close to the same age, maybe. How, yeah. how old are you, Bo? 35. 35. So I, I just turned 34. Okay. So we're, we are. We're pretty close. Yeah. But. Yeah, pretty amazing how things change, you yeah. know. And uh, I remember when I got my first cell phone, I'm like, wait a second. I was around when you could afford the first cell phones. I know. <laughs> Nokia's. I'm like, it makes me feel old, but also yeah. makes me realize, you know, in, in 15 years, the world has changed dramatically. So and much. I can't keep up. And I'm like, you know what? I'll just let social media be where it's at. Yeah. And I'm just going to take my family and live this kind of 21st century grassroots country boy way. Yeah. That's all I, that's how I, I'm comfortable in that realm. I'm with you. Yeah. Well, I think it's healthier for the human soul. I know? think it's healthier. I dove in at one time and I'm like, wait a second. That, I know that's not real, you mm-hmm. know, and that's, that's made uh, to be more than yeah. it is. Yeah. And this, this guy is way out in left field and making everyone else feel mm-hmm. inferior. I'm like, I'm not into it. Yeah. I decided my kids wouldn't have any access at all to anything electronic social. Um, and uh, they also got taken out of public school too. So I, I've really gone yeah. full um, back to old school and my kids learn from books and they watch DVDs uh, they don't stream stuff. And it's funny as they've gone back and consumed content, you know, for entertainment purposes, everything they're kind of soaking up is like eighties and nineties type sitcoms. Hmm. Um, uh, and Friends. sometimes even older than that, you know? Yeah. And, uh, they're really not, they're not consuming today's cultural type content. And so much of it is shallow and vapid and empty well, and sh- and stupid that my kids now, when they do see something that's more modern, they're just like, they're, they're way into the old stuff. Some type of they, agenda being pushed. Yeah. It's anymore, like, you know? it's not, it's not what it used to be. And, uh, having done it that way, um, I see a tremendous difference in their happiness, uh, their, 
their interests in life and uh and then they they are now acutely aware of their friends and how their friends are influenced by the little phones that they carry around in their oh, pockets yeah, big time and and they have certain friends that they really like but they're like she she cannot go 30 seconds without looking at her phone mm -hmm. and i'd say most of their friends have that problem because you can't put that sort of device in a teenager's hands or a young person's hand and not expect them to just like as an adult, it's been a struggle and I'm, yeah. I'm well beyond, you know, my little brain firing at that <laughs> speed and rate and curiosity and all of that. And, and so, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, yeah, I think social media is more uh, negative than positive for humanity at this point, but I still post a few things. Well, I should say Brad still posts a few clips <laughs> on Brad. there. And uh, I hate social media and I read, too. Like, I read some of the DMs um, and I, you know, Brad will point things out and I'll read the comments and comment. But uh, Brad organizes anything we put up there. And, and it's not great, folks. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> fine. It's good. I mean, I have so many photos I could share, share until the end of time of like cool places we've been and they, I, I never do. Like so much cool stuff. Yeah. And I, and I just kind of got tired of it. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite musicians, um, I, I, we were in concert, and that's one thing. I was like, you know, I, I like music a lot, all mm -hmm. kinds of music. You're like, wait, you like that? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, he said, he's like, hey, can you all put your cell phones down just for, just, just for this one song? And he's like, I feel like humanity gets so wrapped up in re recording and, and trying to remember everything that they did and are doing that they forget to experience it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... I realized at one time, I was like, oh, I check my phone. I'm checking my phone. I was doing a lot of social media. I'm checking my phone. I was like, you know what? My son's asking me this question. I don't remember what he asked me. And it's because my mind keeps thinking, I got to keep promoting. I got to keep working. I got to keep marketing. Got to keep yeah. up mm -hmm. to date. And I'm like, we get so busy trying to remember life and the experiences that we forget to experience it. And I'm like, that's, that's huge, right? Yeah. You have to just let it go keep the memory in our heart and just being in the, in the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been healthy for me as a dad and the, and the business owner. I think I have no doubt there are people who leverage uh, social media in a positive way. I think it takes that's skill. Right. I think it takes skill. It's discipline. Um, and some people that's their medium. Like they're really good at it. Uh, we do a lot of affiliate marketing. Like I do commissions. If I get, if, if people buy stuff, I get paid. If they don't, I don't. And, I like that independence it gives me. I can promote anything that I feel like. It gives me an opportunity to see, though, what people, what medium people respond to. When I produce films and podcasts, people people learn about stuff and they like what we do. They might go shop. They might go buy something we recommend. Helps us keep doing our show. Sure. Mm -hmm. When we post to social media. It's like it's like it goes in a black hole. And nobody buys anything. Nobody really? like. I think it's mostly smoke and mirrors. I think so much of humanity is spending all this time there because it seems like it's yeah. valuable, but I I just don't think it's that that critical actually. Well, and I think too, that's a unique perspective on social media. You know, people get put on this high pedestal as well, and like what you see somebody and what you envision them as, you know, and then you actually do meet that person. A lot of times. Not maybe not all yeah. the time, but sometimes you're very disappointed in that person yeah. because you're like, you're not what I thought you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, you know. Yeah, for sure. I think that but. you learn on you learn uh, something I heard the other day that's kind of been in my mind a lot lately was just because something is hard to get doesn't mean it's valuable to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, becoming the richest man in the world or or owning this or having that. It could be high, the, the hot chick, the the money, and the the fancy car. Yeah, it's super hard to get. It's, you know, but just because it's hard to get doesn't in itself make it valuable. You might get it all yeah. and go, huh, I really don't care that much this that just, I have this. This didn't change my core. This just doesn't change who I am. Yeah. Nope. I don't feel like I thought I was going to feel. And, yeah, I think it comes back to the experience thing. And I realized 
I think when I was in college, I had this, this idea is that nothing is ever as it seems, no good or bad. It's yeah. never as it seems, the more you live and realize. And I said to myself one day, I was like, if I was the last person on earth and there was no one to see my fancy truck, mm-hmm. would I still put a lift on it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Or would I still, That's what I mean. Would I still have these $500 wheels? If it, if no one was in the, in the whole world and if the answer is yes, I would be jacked to have those wheels, then put them yeah, on. Right. Yeah. But if it's not, then reevaluate where you're at in your heart and your mind and then get back to fo- focusing on things that really matter to you at your core. Yeah. yeah. Which for me, I cannot wait to go to Hawaii and spearfish with my wife in March. Yeah. It's like... What's yeah. going to happen in 2023 for the hunting season? I don't know, but me and my wife are going to have a ton of <laughs> yeah, right. You know? Right. And I can't wait for my little boy to start wrestling. And yep. just, yeah. You know, like those are the things that I'm, at my core I want and, and matter to me. Yeah. And yeah. I think as the older you get, the bright, shiny things, as you say, you know, they they start to appeal to you less and less. You know, I mean, it's the... I think that's just wisdom. It's just wisdom and everything. I think, it's, you know, as life goes on and you've learned lessons and different stuff like that. You yeah. you begin to really know what's valuable, what's not valuable to you, and and what makes a difference in your life. I graduated from the Marriott School of Business, BYU. I got a great job, big five accounting firm. Got paid a bunch of money. I, I remember we had like a stipend, fifty dollars a day for what? For food. No way. And I'm like, fifty dollars. I didn't a day? even spend seven dollars at Taco <laughs> Bell. Mm-hmm. Now it's fifty bucks a day. I'm like, where do we go? And if you don't spend it, you don't get it. Right. Oh, wow. So it's like. Every day was just fancy this and fancy that. Um, and then you had your hotel, which was super fancy. And then they'd fly you out to the the job wow. uh, Sunday night. You know, you're there Monday through Friday. You go home Friday. You're home for the weekend. You do it again. And so you're, you're, in, and you're sitting down in meetings with people like the CEO at Nike. And I'm talking to them about audits we're performing and, I'm in that world, and at first, right out of college, I I was kind of, I I kind of wanted. I thought it was super cool. Yeah. Way into it, like wow, this is this is neat. It didn't take very long for me to realize how empty it all was, and all I wanted to do was cook an elk steak at home, <laughs> throw a potato on the Traeger, <laughs> like hang out with my wife and watch you know a show or whatever, like yeah. just simple stuff. Mm-hmm. I realized I didn't really. That stuff got old so fast. Yeah. And again, just because it's hard to attain didn't mean it was of value. Of what you really wanted. Of what I really wanted. And so I think a lot of people confuse that, you know, something is is difficult to get. They confuse that with value. It's not necessarily true because those things may not align with with what you really care about in life. I think it relates to jobs, to everything in life. Yeah. I always say I'm rich in lifestyle. Yeah. I'm rich in time. So uh, we had a, I was kind of hmm. offline. I was telling you about some sponsor that was, we, we had these conversations and they're right. like, but we're going to pay you all this money if you say these things and do this stuff. And, and I'm like, yeah, I don't really care. I don't, <laughs> I don't want your money. Yeah. And they're like, but it's all this money. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm not really motivated by money. They're like, but all you have to do is this much work per week for like the next two months. And I'm like, that's time. And I, and I, and my response was, look, that's too much of my time because I'm rich in time. Mm-hmm. I've built my life to be rich in time. I get to go hunt for six weeks in a row yeah. and it's then easy. come home for a month and then go hunt for another six weeks in a row. Like I'm rich in time. I have time, 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 time. I'm not really rich in money and I'm okay with that. But that has allowed me to, to, uh, when I am approached and someone says, we're going to pay you a whole bunch of money. I don't look at it in terms of dollar bills. I look at it in terms of time being taken away because at the end of the day, when you look at life, time was the most important thing we had. It is. It yeah. wasn't the money. And so I think we all got it backwards instead of, selling your your time in a certain way for what it's worth and how you're going to spend your life we we trade that for vast amounts of money for comfort and wealth and status which really doesn't actually give us the thing we want which is generally more time i remember tim ferris wrote yeah. the book uh, four hour work weekend he's sitting there talking to some guy 
Uh, he does this analogy of the story. He's in like Puerto Rico or something. I don't know, South America. And he's down there, this rich guy, and he's fishing. And he's fishing with this guy, this this local. And they spend all day on this boat. And they catch all these cool fish off the ocean and the gulf. And then they flow back in. And they're at the house. And they're eating like and they're drink, sipping Mai Tais on the beach and, you know, and they're hanging out. And the guy goes, dude, you have such a sick setup here. Uh, you know, you're, you're only like, you're a guide for like two people uh, a month. And that, he's like, dude, if you got more money and you were able to get this boat and then you got this boat and you hired these three guys and you did this thing, you could grow this thing into this big deal and you could make this much money and da da da. And the guy that was just the simple you know, fisherman guy was like, for what? And he's like, well, so that you can fish all day on the beach, hang out and have a simple life. He's like, well, I already have it. Like, (laughs) you know, and I think we kind of fall prey to that. Like if we were just a little more content with, uh, some simple things that are really of value Mm -hmm. here, he is this, this high powered rich guy saying, Dude, if you just spent your whole life building, then you could retire and do what he's already doing without all that money anyway. Like yeah. it's possible without all of that to still to do so much that we take for granted. So yep. anyway, it's very good perspective. You know, at the end of the hunting season, I, I feel like I have because we're done working mostly, you know, we're getting ready for next year and you're done spending time in the backwoods. And I'm like, you know, I got to spend a lot of time as a dad and I look at other people's mm-hmm. lives and not necessarily that I opinionize or judge them, but I just evaluate them. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm a blessed man. Yeah. And I had a dream of raising my kids on a ranch and having a business and we're doing it. And I'm like, man, just now embrace it because you're living what you dreamt of. Mm-hmm. And it's actually very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, we, uh, anyway, we were just talking about the same thing uh, with our kids. I'm like, I'm gone for a month or two, but then I'm annoyingly present in my daughter's lives, like all day, every day. Yeah. Like, when they wake up in the morning, I'm there all day long. I'm having lunch. I'm poking them. I'm hugging them. I'm talking to them. And then through the night and into the evening. And even though I am gone for like September and October, almost the whole time, then I'm back and I'm really present the whole time. And I feel like my wife even says, you're home way more. You feel like you're way more in our lives than you were when you went nine to five. We saw you for two or three hours each yeah. evening. It, mm-hmm. And then that was it. And yeah. so I do think, um, I do think it's important to, to, to structure that life and, you know, try to make it so you are as present as possible. Yeah. Um, Spe- yeah time. So time. Yeah. This is good. Llamas, llamas to, <laughs> llamas uh, time. Llamas yeah. to time in life. That's that right. Cool. Quite the tangent Thank you for yeah. this perspective. Yeah. It's really good. All right, folks. Check out uh, Bo Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas yep. dot right com. Should have came up with a better name. Twelve years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, all right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty. <laughs>